Welcome to Issues That Matter. I'm Cynthia Pooler. My guest today is Scott Ritter. And today we're going to talk about the um, bombing that happened in Poland. So what's your take on that? Well, my take is that, um, <laughs> I mean, it, it, this is actually far more complicated than uh, than than the uh, the the narrative um, suggests. Um, first of all, the, we know that it's a Polish S three hundred service to air missile that impacted. I mean, a, a Ukrainian S three hundred service to air missile that impacted in Poland. That's without dispute. And yet, and 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 the other point I'll make is everybody knew that the moment it happened. Everybody knew that the moment it happened. The Poles knew it. The Latvians knew it, the Estonians knew it, the Lithuanians knew it. Uh, why? Because they're all NATO members and NATO tracks everything that occurs over Ukraine. Every missile launch, every plane that enters that airspace is tracked real time. Um, so when that surface to air missile was launched, it was picked up by NATO sensors and tracked by NATO radar, uh, tracked by NATO aircraft. Um, uh, from the point of launch to the point of impact. So everybody knew in NATO. And yet what happened? Immediately, the Polish, the Lithuanians, the Estonians, the Latvians are screaming that it was a Russian attack. And they were demanding that NATO um, invoke Article 4, which was would be an emergency meeting where they discuss um, issues of national security interest among members. In this case, it would be these members talking about Ukraine and the threat posed by Russia, and they were seeking to extend NATO air defense coverage into Ukraine airspace and even to impose a no-fly zone over Ukraine. This means war with Russia, plain and simple, war with Russia. So why would these nations, knowing that this was not a Russian missile, make this kind of action straight up? Why would they go this direction? Um, it means that they were waiting for something. They were anticipating something. They were prepared for something. And that something was, of course, this missile that landed on Polish soil, which now takes us to part two of this. The Zelensky government has denied that this was a, um, a Ukrainian missile. They said straight up, it wasn't ours. Even after all the evidence showed that it was a Ukrainian missile, even after President Biden called and said it was a Ukrainian missile. Why would Zelensky do this? Because he wasn't in the know. Because he was told by his Air Force commander and his senior military commanders that we didn't do this. All of our missiles were fired against uh, uh, Russian incoming missiles. Now, how could they be so confident that this wasn't a mistake? Because even, let's say, hypothetically speaking, that a S-300 uh, missile malfunctioned, and they have. They malfunctioned, first of all, we need to understand the, 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 the environment that this took place in. It took place at a time when Russians were firing lots of cruise missiles and ballistic missiles into Ukraine, and Ukraine mean air defense was responding. The missiles are primarily coming from an east to west direction. Ukraine air defense is layered to protect against that, which means that its radars and its missiles are oriented from a west to east direction. The radars are picking up the, the Russian missiles and then tracking radars track the missile, guiding their surface to air missiles to it from a west to east trajectory. How did a Ukrainian missile end up going from an east to west trajectory and striking Poland? If it was a malfunction, um, it wouldn't have been able to sustain that ballistic arc. It was fired, supposed to track on radar, it broke track, it would circle around, impact the ground, go up, down, but this went on a perfect ballistic trajectory to Poland. That can only happen if one of these radars had been oriented towards Poland, painting a point in the sky, allowing the missile to track on it till fuel uh, termination, it burned up all its fuel, and then it goes on a ballistic trajectory into Poland. That's the only way this could happen which means that somebody on the ground aimed a radar towards Poland, fired this missile so they would impact on the ground. And Poland, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania were waiting for this to happen. This was a provocation on the part of somebody in Ukraine 
who is seeking to get NATO intervention because, frankly speaking, Ukraine is losing the war. Zelensky was unaware of this. So this means that Zelensky is not in control of Ukraine. This is an extraordinarily dangerous situation. And the media is just not picking up on it. These missiles just don't go off track like this. They don't go 180 degrees out in a prefer perfect ballistic trajectory unless they're guided by a radar, which means the radar is oriented in the exact opposite direction it needs to be when responding to a Russian attack. Mm. So um, when you were listening to the reports on TV or on the radio or what you were reading, what was your reaction? Well, I mean, to be honest, my first reaction was, oops, um, a Russian missile um, you know, went wild. But then I'm thinking, the Russians are smarter than this. Uh, they would not fire, if, for instance, if you're going to strike a target near the Polish border, you're going to make sure that you are at the end of the range arc of this. You don't want, just in case there's a mistake that is made, just in case it's hit by a surface air, uh, by a, a surface air missile and goes off track uh, or it malfunctions, you don't want to have it having the capability to go an extra 70 to 100 kilometers. Well, the Russians are smarter than this. So the missiles that are going to come in, they're going to be fired at the very end of their range arc. So their maximum range out. So there's no chance for in-depth penetration. That's just the smart thing to do. Or they're going to come in at an angle that takes them perpendicular to the Polish axis. So instead of coming in from a direct west to east trajectory, they might come in from a, a, a north to south trajectory or a south to north trajectory. But again, at the maximum range of their arc, so there's no deviation, no chance for this kind of mistake. Uh, Russian military planners are fully aware of the dangers that would be accrued by seeing by being seen as striking Poland. Remember, Poland is the launching ground for all this logistics assistance that's coming into uh, Ukraine. And so NATO and the Poles are very sensitive to the potential of a Russian strike against warehouses containing these weapons before they're brought into Ukraine. So Russia is not going to help feed this um, <clears throat> this paranoia by carrying out a strike that would allow a Russian missile the possibility of entering polar space. So I said, well, then man, this this is difficult. You know, I, I can't square this one. Why would a Russian missile be in Poland? Um, but then I looked at the debris, and instantly I said, that's a surface-to-air missile. And uh, and then when the photographs came out, and you could look at the, at the numbers. You could track them to previous uh, incidents that occurred in uh, Azerbaijan, uh, where S-300 missiles have gone astray. And you see the similarity in not only the markings, but in the construct. And there was an S-300 missile, and the, uh, the Ukrainians are the only ones using S-300 missiles um, in that range arc, meaning the possibility to strike Poland, only Ukrainian S-300 missiles. And it became clear to me that it was a it was an S-300 missile, that this was a mistake. And I fully expected the story to be reported that way, to everybody just to calm down. But they didn't. NATO went crazy. Ukraine denies. Um, <laughs> it's a weird situation. So, you know, in our previous conversation, you had mentioned that we're one second away from doomsday. Are we closer than one second away? Or do you think because of this scare, we're more than one second away? No, I mean, we haven't learned anything. Um, I mean, we still have NATO now, um, you know, talking, discussing uh, not just, you know, the potential of a no-fly zone or extending air defense, but now because of a Polish surface air missile or Ukrainian surface air missile landing in Poland, the European Union is considering calling Russia a state sponsor of terrorism. It's insane. Um, so I, I, I continue to say that we are one mistake away from a nuclear conflict. And that mistake will, of course, be made by NATO, not by the Russians. Um, and NATO is just apparently doing everything they can to create the possibility of such a mistake. Uh, because what happens if, if, if this goes through? If, if you call Russia, if you create the legal foundation for labeling Russia a state sponsor of terror, um, not only are there economic consequences, but there's uh, there, there's moral and legal obligations to deal with Russia. It creates a, a whole new framework 
of uh, potential of conflict with Russia. And again, let me just make it clear. Any NATO with conflict with Russia is going to end in a nuclear exchange that will terminate all life on the planet. So, no, I mean, this is just NATO being stupid again, literally. I mean, it's, a, it's an organization that represents one of the greatest threats, not only to European security, but global security, a threat to all mankind. And the sooner we can get rid of this organization, the better. When you say, um, well, you know, the whole world will be blown up, all, all life. Are you saying everything in all the continents? Yes. If there's a general nuclear exchange between the United States and Russia, where thousands of um, you know high megatonnage, high kilotonnage uh, warheads are exploded, um, the nuclear winter effect um, combined with the spread of radiation uh, will, over the course of just a few months, kill everything. Uh, that seems so incomprehensible to me. The whole world will be destroyed. Well, right. it, 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 it will be destroyed. Um, we knew this back in the 80s. We, we, everybody knew it. That's why we were trying to get rid of nuclear weapons. But we somehow have forgotten that nuclear weapons are you know, a global killer. We've allowed our populations have allowed themselves to be desensitized to the horror of nuclear conflict. Uh, some even believe that there can be containable nuclear conflict, limited nuclear war. We can win a nuclear war uh, because of their ignorance. But the fact is, if there's a general nuclear exchange between the United States and Russia, um, it will be the end of life, all life, all human life on this planet. Um, do you Cockroaches think Cockroaches will live, though. Cockroaches will live. Oh, terrific. Yeah. Uh, do you think Zelensky is becoming more unhinged as this unfolds? Well, he's always been unhinged. We've just done a good job in the Western media to, uh, to shape his narrative, shape his image, to control uh, the insanity that is Zelensky and the Zelensky government. But this uh, Polish uh, missile crisis has shown that he, um, he's completely out of touch with reality. And it also shows the extent to which um, he, he is not the driver. He is, he is a tool being used by other powers, by other players. Um, and he's embarrassing the West right now. The, you know, his behavior in regards to this has uh, embarrassed the West. And I, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. I think uh, his time as president is limited. Um, I believe that uh, the West is preparing the conditions to have him replaced. Um, and I believe that his replacement will come from within the Ukrainian defense establishment, uh, more than likely the current uh, chief of staff of the uh, Ukrainian military. Um, but we'll see. Um, you know, I, I just, Zelensky came off as a man who's totally out of touch, out of control, um, not operating in the present reality and, and capable of saying things that, I mean, you just don't contradict your largest supporters in public like you did. I mean, Joe Biden is the only reason why Zelensky's around today, uh, than the tens of billions of dollars of US taxpayer money that he's provided to the Ukrainian government. And Zelensky is, um, you know, is, is in public contradicting Joe Biden. Um, it's a big mistake. This is the president of the United States. Whether or not, as an American, you agree with him is irrelevant. He's the president of the United States, and he's the one telling Zelensky, he's the only one keeping Zelensky alive, and Zelensky's contradicting him in public. Not, not a good game plan. I, I think Zelensky's on his way out. So was the United States instrumental in putting Zelensky where he is? Well, I don't know about putting Zelensky where he is. Zelensky was put where he is because of Ukrainian oligarchs, but those Ukrainian oligarchs you know, are in the business of um, facilitating, you know, this expansive money laundering scheme. I mean, we still haven't come to grips about FTX, the Democratic Party, and uh, and the provision of uh, tens of billions of dollars of U.S. taxpayer money, FTX being a crypto exchange that uh, collapsed recently. Um, we, we, we found out as soon as Ukraine received the tens of billions of dollars, they heavily invested in FTX, and then FTX turned around and provided a significant... Um, underwriting for the Democratic Party. I mean, this is literally the definition of money laundering, the corruption of politics. Um, and I think we're going to find uh, more and more uh, about uh, uh, the unsavory relationship between the Biden administration and the Ukrainian government and these unaccountable financial um, 
largesse that's been flowing this way. Uh, the Republicans have indica indicated they're getting ready to investigate it uh, once they take control of the House. And I believe these investigations will lead to criminal charges and um, definitely um, the impeachment of Joe Biden. Of course, the, the Democrats control the Senate, which means Biden will stay in power. But stand by. Biden is going to be impeached. The day, you know, and the Republicans have pretty much said it just for political reasons. Uh, you know, Donald Trump is not going to be the only impeached American president. Uh, Joe Biden is going to join that ranks. Now, Biden won't be compelled to leave office because the Senate will protect him. But uh, we're getting ready to enter the, a very silly season, a very dangerous season. Um, and uh, I think some of the, the, the things the Republicans are, will be, are going to be investigating um, will have merit to them, meaning, uh, especially when we get into this money. Uh, this, this, you don't pour this kind of money into the most corrupt nation on the planet, a corrupt nation that has a long history of having that corruption used by senior Americans uh, to launder money. I mean, I, we may not have heard the last of Hunter Biden. Um, I think we're going to hear more about him as well. I just uh, heard on the TV that uh, if the Republicans do uh, investigate Hunter Biden, nothing's going to come out of it. Do you have a different uh, different opinion? I, I mean, I'd, I'd have to understand what they're what they're saying. Um, nothing's going to come out of it. No criminal charges. I don't know. I'm not a criminal prosecutor, uh, but politically speaking. Uh, Biden's relationship with Burisma um, and his father's relationship with with Hunter um, are <laughs> something's going to come out of this. There, you know, in this where there's smoke, there's fire. Here, there's a forest fire of corruption, and um, you know, the Biden family is knee deep in it, neck deep in it, and it's continued. I think you know, this isn't just going to be about what happened when Biden was vice president, uh, et cetera. This is going to be what happened while Biden was president and his role and transferring tens of billions of US taxpayer dollars to the single most corrupt nation in the world and how that relates back to Democratic Party politics. I, I think a lot's gonna come from this. So the next two years are gonna be quite interesting. And, and along the lines of the old Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. Yep, we're, we're gonna right. be cursed. So, um... <sighs> I'm not that well versed on what happened uh, this week. So do you have any final thoughts about the whole situation? This war is an extraordinarily dangerous war. Um, and it's winding down um, with the momentum pointing to a decisive Russian military victory. The key question here is how the United States and NATO uh, choose to um, manage this 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 victory will it be a soft landing or will it be a hard landing a soft landing would be where we recognize the inevitability of ukrainian defeat and we work to mitigate the consequences of that for europe and the united states a hard landing is where we uh, go down to uh, paraphrase uh, the dylan thomas poem instead of uh, going gently into that good night we're going to rage rage against the dying of the light fight the russians all the way and that could lead to the potential of a conflict, which we've already discussed, could end in a nuclear exchange that terminates all human life on the planet. Wow. So um, how's your how's your blog going? Well, I, I mean, I, I, I write and um, people appear to like it. I'm, I, I don't know how to measure metrics of this nature. So um, we'll we'll see the um, and, uh, you know, the book. Uh, I've got a big, uh, a big event this week in uh, Boston. I'm, uh, I'm speaking uh, in Boston. So uh, anybody who's in the Boston area, um, feel free to arrive. I think it starts at six o'clock. Uh, Massachusetts Peace Action is putting it on. You can go on their website and, and find it. And, um, and uh, we're just going to keep plugging away. So what's the name of your, uh, your website? Uh, it's, it's scottritterextra.com. And on that website, we post um, all the, for instance, this interview will be posted on it. Um, all my writing gets posted on it. And then there's some unique um, unique content. And again, it's uh, it's not behind a paywall. Um, you can access it uh, free of charge, but if people decide they'd like to contribute and donate, um, we would appreciate that as well. And tell us a little bit about the uh, 
thesis of your book? Well, the book, uh, Disarm at the Time of Perestroika, is a history of, um, I mean, here we are talking about the potential of nuclear conflict. Um, and it's a history of um, one of the more important moments in US-Soviet history, where we um, actually signed a treaty and implemented a treaty to get rid of an entire class of uh, nuclear weapons, intermediate range weapons. And this is a personal history of, that I, I played a, a role in the implementation of this treaty in the first three years. Uh, so this is the story of that, how we overcame a lot of obstacles to accomplish this task. But also in the context of today, it's a, a template of hope. People say, how do we get out of this mess? I, I remind people, and if you read the book, you'll see that um, <laughs> things were worse in the 1980s. <laughs> and, and yet we found a way to, through arms control, to create a cooperative environment that reduced tensions, eliminated a class of nuclear weapons, and promoted peace. And you know, this is a template of hope that you know, one way we can get out of the current predicament is to return to the arms control table, negotiate a meaningful uh, nuclear reduction treaty with the, uh, with the Russians, and once again, begin working with them in a cooperative fashion, not to terminate all life on the planet, but to promote peace and security. I, I hope everybody buys your book. Um, you've been listening to Scott Ritter. I'm Cynthia Pooler. This is Issues That Matter. And if you like this program, please subscribe to my YouTube page. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks, Scott. Thank you.